Welcome to the seventh annual Bay Area Book Festival. I'm Julia Drake with the festival. I'm so delighted to introduce this event tonight. Tonight's program is entitled How to Dream the World You Want. Nnedi Okorafor and Jeff Vandermeer on resistance and transformation. We're thrilled to have these authors with us tonight. Nnedi Okorafor is a Nigerian American author of African Futurism and African Dujuism for children and adults. Her works include Who Fears Death, which is in development for television with HBO right now, the BT novella trilogy, The Book of Phoenix, the Akata books, Lagoon, and her latest remote control. She is the winner of Hugo Nebula World Fantasy Locus and Lodestar Awards in her debut novel, Zara the Windseeker, won the prestigious Wola Suinka Prize for Literature. Jeff Vandermeer is the author of Dead Astronauts, Born in the Southern Reach trilogy, the first volume of which won the Nebula Award, among others. It sold over a million copies and was adapted uh, into film by Alex Garland. Jeff speaks and writes frequently about climate change, and the New Yorker called him the Weird Thoreau. The new novel is uh, Hummingbird Salamander, which he will discuss tonight. And Jeff lives in Tallahassee, Florida, with his wife, um, Anne Vandermeer, who's also a, an award-winning science and fantasy writer. And the conversation will be moderated by Isabel Yap. Isabel writes poetry and fiction, works in the tech industry, and has just published her debut short story collection, Never Have I Ever, with Small Beer Press. Her work has also appeared in outlets like Best Year's Weird Fiction and Tour.com. She was born and raised in Manila, and she has a, uh, an MBA um, from Harvard Business School. She's currently the secretary at the Clarion Foundation, which hosts an acclaimed um, science fiction and uh, fantasy workshop. And take it away, Isabel, and everybody have a great conversation. Um, thank you, Julia. I'm Isabel Yap, and I'm excited to be talking with Nnedi Okorafor and Jeff Vandermeer this evening. Um, so hi, Nnedi. Hi, Jeff. Uh, very hi. excited to be chatting. Um, I wanted to start with a somewhat generic question, I guess. Um, the title of the conversation is How to Dream the World You Want. Uh, and I wanted to ask you guys about imagination. Um, specifically, do you develop your imaginations consciously? And is that something you're really thinking a lot about as you approach your, your stories? Um, Nettie, if you want to start. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, well, I wouldn't say that I'm thinking consciously about, um, you know, you know, about what I want to, what I want to imagine when I'm, when I'm writing a story, um, I would definitely say, well, I, I'm very much a, a subconscious writer, a panther. I don't outline. Um, so whatever comes, comes. Like I never know, mm -hmm. I never know what's going to come until I sit down and write it. But at the same time, I do know that like, there are certain things that I am obsessed with and that I love and that I'm always thinking about in my free time, in my non-writing time where like my mind just, there's certain things where my, that my, where my mind just kind of plays in those, those areas and those, it, be it issues or just things that I love or things that I wish or things that I, that I see and I'm just dwelling on. So those things are always going on. Those things are always kind of spinning in my mind. So when I sit down to write, mm -hmm. I just dive into that. So it's, it's, it's really, it's not something that I know when I sit down to sit down to write. It's something that kind of is revealed to me or that I discover as I'm writing. Mm -hmm. Jeff, how about you? Yeah. And I, um, I just try very hard to reward my subconscious, which is really a large part of my writing process. I also don't do like a formal outline. Sometimes I will partway through, I will start to do some kind of structural thing on the side just to kind of keep myself oriented. But it's really important to me that, that I write down every idea that comes to me because that's <laughs> how I keep getting ideas. And so every little tiny bit goes on a scrap of paper uh, and most of it gets used at some point, whether it's on the novel I'm working on or something later, but that's how it keeps coming and coming. And then also just fostering a sense of play. And, you know, that can be on social media and that actually helps the writing. So sometimes when I'm telling stories about the animals in the yard on Twitter, that's also kind of storytelling. It's kind of like keeping my imagination fresh. And then the other thing I'm always thinking about when I'm just like walking around town or whatever, not that I'm doing a lot of walking around town during the pandemic, but, but yeah. is this idea that it's not just that, you know, fiction writers tell stories. It's that everything we see that's human made 
is from somebody's imagination. It was some kind of story they wanted to tell in a sense. So a -hmm. badly made house is a kind of, you know what I'm saying? It's like, how do we get to a better future? Well, we need to have a better imagination about the things around us and the things that we create. And so I I often think about what's the background story of the thing I'm looking at right now uh, that has nothing to do with fiction. And and that also kind of begins to feed back in uh, to the storytelling that I do. Yeah. Um, I want to pick up on something you said about how everything's basically storytelling. So, you know, I read your most recent books, I read Remote Control and Hummingbird Salamander, and I feel like um, the protagonists, you know, are in these like quite hostile environments um, and they're always on their own when it's coming to survival. So I was kind of curious, like, why were their stories, the stories that you chose to work on, um, you know, at that point, like why this project? Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll start with Jeff this time. Um, you know, it, I tend to, to like have like, uh, eight or nine <laughs> novel ideas at the same time, uh, after say like a book tour or something, I kind of like get in this mode where I, I don't want to write, but then I have a ton of ideas that come to me. And then I spend like the next decade, like basically <laughs> writing all those ideas and thinking about them. So it often looks like I have like book after book after book out, but in actual fact, there's like years sometimes that go into thinking about it ahead of time mm-hmm. with hummingbird yeah. salamander. It just happened to uh, be the one that, 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 that came to germination or, or, or fruition at this moment. And also I was really happy that it was in the sense that I got really frozen during the pandemic on certain things, but being able to write this book and kind of channel my stress and anxiety about the moment into a book that is dealing with the moment to some degree uh, mm-hmm. was a kind of method acting that really, I think, helped the novel and h- helped me as well. And the protagonist is is just a, a you know complex, contradictory, uh, not always sympathetic. I like writing about people who are are really real uh, and and don't always recognize their flaws or their own contradictions. And and so Jane, you know, at the center of this this uh, environmental mystery uh, is 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 definitely someone that that by herself is a story, <laughs> in addition mm-hmm. to the plot that she kind of walks through. Yeah, Nettie, how about for yourself? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm always. There are always ideas for like that are always floating around, um, floating around my head, and so, like I'm just being alive and through the world and living and participating and letting things affect. So, so stories for me aren't hard to um, to draw from, mm-hmm. but like there's always one that eventually bubbles to the surface that my, my mind is just obsesses over. And, and it's typically it's used to the character. And so for remote control, it was that main character, uh, Fatima slash Sankofa, who, you know, I, I, in her for actually many years, remote control took me over six years to write. And like, mm-hmm. and she, she first appeared in another story that I was writing and she just never, she just, never left me i mean yeah. she's this type of character who the way that she handles um the way that she handles tragedy and things that happen to her the, the she handles these things with this sort of control i mean that's where the <laughs> title came from but <laughs> but like she hand and, and so that that aspect of her character has always um just, just, just stayed with me. Just stayed with me, especially the fact that she was so young. You know, she's mm-hmm. a very young character, but she deals with some very, very heavy stuff. So it's like, so yeah, there's always one, one story or mainly character who bubbles to the surface that I'm obsessed with, and that that is, um, my characters talk to me as well. So I, you know, and they can be very pushy and adamant, and <laughs> some of them are mean, some of them are nice. Sankofa was okay. She was, she was cool. Um, some of my other characters have been very mean, but like, you know, and, and they can be very, um, they don't let the story go. Like if I'm mm-hmm. not writing the story, they, they, they let me know. So, so there's, so that often helps as well. But, and also one more thing about remote control, it was also the world, the world mm-hmm. that, that the story is set in. I'm just obsessed with that. It's near future. It's near future Africa, specifically Ghana, specifically Northern Ghana. Um, 
and wanting to see that world and wanting to dwell in it and wanting to walk in it and smell it and, and hear it and see just just all have all of my senses touched you know just wanting to do that like that definitely was what pulled me in as well and that just boy like I it didn't leave me you know and, and that's what it took me so many years to write that but it never that that narrative in that place mm. just was it was always like at the back at the back of everything that I was doing that's awesome. Um, I want to touch on your your comment on setting, actually, because I feel like place is so critical um, to both of your, your stories. Uh, and I was curious, um, I guess I have two questions about it. One is, given the pandemic, right, and how challenging it's been to go outside, how do you still continue to like ground yourself in, in these settings? Um, and the second piece of it is, for both of these books, I felt like the setting was, you know, just like very slightly into the future, but it felt very like, like it could be taking place today, honestly, except for a little bit of the technology. So how do you go about, you know, balancing sort of that gap between where we are today and then this future that you're imagining? Um, yeah. yeah, Nettie, maybe you could start. Yeah, the in terms of the writing these places w- within the pandemic, that was weird. That was a, a very weird experience um but but like for me it was um i'm i'm one of those writers where like the pandemic just caused me to have this explosion of creativity like an explosion i think a lot of it had to do with the fact that i couldn't go anywhere so so like binti's people i went inward instead of outward so like i i I, when i couldn't go outside i had to find a way to play and so I went inward and, and dwelled and all that. So, so like um, at the time when, when the pandemic happened, I was editing remote control and that was, a, just, man, it was, it was writing for me was a really, it was therapeutic in a lot of ways because when I'm writing something, I'm there, mm. I'm there. And that's why writing some of the painful stuff that I've had to write is very unpleasant, but <laughs> for the more, the, the, the more pleasant aspect is like, I'm there. So even though I could, you know, during the height of it where we had to be on lockdown and we couldn't go outside for days, I would be inside for days. Um, the writing was sort of a release for me. It was a, it was mm-hmm. an escape, even though not an escape in, in the, in the sense of, you know, I'm going into this fantastical world where nothing bad happens. Not like that kind of escape. It was like going into, I, I just had a, a doorway where I could go into another world and it was, it was, I was outside. I could be outside. So, so in that way, it was interesting. Um, it was interesting telling stories during, during the pandemic. Um, and, and then th- there were aspects of, of remote control. So it's set in a very near future. So there's like that part of um, that part of it where you're like, okay, this things are happening in the world that are just unprecedented, and like, mm-hmm. so I'm writing in the near future. So now I'm going to have to incorporate this. And for for remote control, it was not hard at all. Like it fit right in. <laughs> A pandemic happening or multiple pandemics happening, um, it didn't disturb the story at all. It just slipped right in and i and i remember at one point where we were in the editing like we were beyond the editing process we were like it was basically done and i remember i woke up (laughs) and was like i've got to add this one specific sentence to to the manuscript and it was you know it's a reference to the pandemic and it just because it just made complete sense and then i started thinking there's some things that happen at the very beginning of remote control that would echo the pandemic and like, I couldn't have that happen without, you know, without the narrative being aware of that. So that, mm-hmm. you know, it was, you know, it was an interesting, it was an interesting experience. It didn't, it didn't make me feel like, okay, everything I've written is wrong. It didn't feel like, actually, I was onto something. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's almost like you, your, your subconscious, because it was driving the story, could kind of see it, which is scary in its own way. Yeah. 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 Jeff, how about for you? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, like Nettie said it, I mean, the thing is it depends on what distance you're taking in your narrative from current events anyway. And and I never really want to be so close anyway, that it's too topical. Uh, Cause I, I like, like people to be able to reread the work and, 
and get something out of it maybe 10 years down the road, hopefully, that's, that's nothing to do with what was happening at the current moment. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, one of my big decisions was I wasn't going to mention the the our former president, uh, recent former president <laughs> by name, because that brings all kinds of associations in, even though this is set basically in our recent past, our present, and then our immediate future. And that meant that there was going to be distance in other ways. And so that allowed me to kind of mention the pandemic and kind of like have it be always in the backdrop without actually... Uh, having it be in the foreground. But that also was important to me because I felt like in addition to the T word bringing in a lot of associations, everyone has their own uh, experience of the pandemic. So they're going to bring that to any novel they're reading right now that's got that in it. And I thought I would kind of get in the way of that experience if I put too much about the pandemic in. So I wanted that space for the reader. But in terms of the research, you know, a lot of the book is set on the West Coast. And I actually took a trip as part of a book tour right before the pandemic hit, which was really weird because I I did this like book tour for Dead Astronauts, my last novel in December of 2019, just this whirlwind tour of like <laughs> meeting so many people and then shut down. You know, it's just such a strange <laughs> position. But I, I actually went down the West Coast kind of like I was my character, thinking about what she would see rather than what I would see. Uh, because I knew there were going to be scenes where she was doing the same thing. And I I did like research that was hilarious in retrospect. Like I stayed at all these really kind of um, skeezy hotels or motels because I thought that this person probably would st- try to be off the map a little bit. So I stayed mm-hmm. in one when it was really cold where they had actually taken a space heater and just glued it into the drywall. <laughs> Oh, um, and I didn't even turn it on. <laughs> like, I was afraid it was going to burn the place down. So I just, yeah. I just slept in my coat all night <laughs> and, um, and, oh, man. and, and then went on. And then the hilarious thing was in the novel, it turns out that she doesn't actually move from place to place on the West coast. So none of that stuff got into it, but I did get the feel of what the coast was like in a way that I wouldn't have, if I hadn't been purposeful. So it's definitely true during the pandemic that it, it has hurt me not to have the ability to travel to some degree to mm-hmm. experience different things that might be going into future work because I really need a lot of the detail I work with to be firsthand. It's extremely important to me in terms of how mm-hmm. I build characters uh, in part because I, I really build characters in setting the same way. It's always going to be what the character will see or omit from seeing that tells me a lot about them and, and allows me to have a sense of how they're going to even react to like other characters. Uh, so what I did, I think, is my imagination was like, okay, so you're stuck here. So the next things you're going to write are actually about weird architecture and houses. And so, so the next thing that I was working on is actually about this guy who's surveilling a house. And it just turns out that the house that he's surveilling from is the same house built by the same architect so they're identical um and he doesn't know that the architect is still living somewhere in one of the two houses <laughs> and it's actually really really <laughs> creepy and uh and uh very claustrophobic and of course that's how i've been feeling this year is claustrophobic and you know all the neighbors are kind of like you, know, you look out at each other you don't know you know who's vaccinated who's not <laughs> who has a, a a mask protocol who doesn't and and so i've, I've just kind of like turned inward to write fiction um, and, 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 and then hopefully when I get out and about again, I'll have those details, uh, coming in that really br- bring the other stuff come, uh, uh, come to life. So, so that's kind of where I am with, with that stuff and how I think about character. And I, I never can think of character and setting as, as, as separate for the most part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you both have stressed at this point that, you know, building character and inhabiting the character is really crucial to your process and and like internalizing them. And I'm thinking about your stories and how much like trauma <laughs> the characters go through and, and you know, that um, that violence, right? That's just like a part of their environment um, and how they have to, you know, survive. And, and both characters I've found were very lonely, um, which, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing where you're like, I'm not necessarily my protagonist, but parts of me are in there, right? Uh, I'm curious when you're when you're working on those difficult scenes or working on, um, you know, scenes that deal with trauma, for example, even if it may have happened in the past. Like, how do you manage that if it's if it is challenging for you? Um, and yeah, like, how do you manage that like headspace of occupying these characters so closely? Um, yeah. Whoever wants to start. 
Um, well, I, I guess I think of it as, yeah. as, as damage. And I think I, when I'm writing a character, mm-hmm. I think of just how much damage has been inflicted other more lack of damage, which is sometimes also something that, that can either be a, a character plus or a flaw, um, you know, uh, in a very minor way. I, I had a lot of damage inflicted on me early in my career that I think is really useful to uh, being successful in terms of being able to like laugh off things that happen in publishing that that otherwise I wouldn't mm-hmm. be able to. Uh, and then there's other things that are more uh, traumatic from my childhood that that I that I can't laugh off and that I write about in in the fiction sometimes. Mm-hmm. I think that you know when I'm writing characters that have more extended families and are trying for connection, that's when my collaborator in a sense is my wife, Anne, because she comes from a large extended family. And it's not that I can't intellectually understand that, but for a long time, for me, a second cousin was like a space alien. And to Mm -hmm. her, if something happened to a second cousin, it was a major, major deal. Uh, And so she helps me understand those relationships. So like in a novel like Born, where people are trying to connect uh, and there is more connection in general, she was really instrumental in that, not just being an intellectual exercise for me, but being able to inhabit that emotionally. And then when I write a character like Jane, I'm basically in one sense, in addition to all the other things she is that are not me, is I am channeling a kind of aloneness uh, that I experienced as a child. But then also the fact that as an adult, there are definitely times when I like to be alone. And I think of Jane as someone who, once she kind of like gets out of the parameters of her normal life, which would be for many people, a great life, she's actually happier because of the kind of person she is. So, um, so I don't know that I always think of her as being lonely so much as she is alone, mm. um, but that may be the way that she likes to be, so. Mm. Yeah, Nettie? Yeah. Um, on loneliness, um, I'm very much in, I guess, an extroverted introvert. So mm. I, like my, my default is alone, you know, I'm, 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 I'm good, <laughs> you know? And, and so like, I think I channel, I do think I channeled that a lot in, in mm. when I'm, when I'm writing. So like oftentimes there, you know, you'll have a, a character who is very alone, like, like in remote control and she'll, or he, she, usually she will be comfortable in that loneliness. <laughs> that comes from me. I, I'm just going to admit <laughs> that just comes from me. I did recently write something I, I wrote a, a recent story where the main character was a massive extrovert and my God, I had to really <laughs> draw from like, I had to just draw from my sister and like, I, it felt so <laughs> weird. I, I could do it, but it was like, it definitely didn't have the, the same comfort. Like I, I, it wasn't as easy for me, you know, um, in terms of trauma, like how do I manage trauma when I, when I write um, traumatic moments, yeah. And, and things that happen to my characters um, that I, I think even managing won't even be the right word for it because there are, there are certain moments there, there's, there's one moment in remote control. There were two or three in, in, um, in who fears death. There were moments like this in um, the book of Phoenix and those moments of deep trauma took from me. I can honestly say they took from me. And when I wrote them, like either I suffered nightmares, couldn't sleep, um, were, was like in a, a kind of emotional pain. I remember with Who Fears Death, there were scenes in Who Fears Death where, you know, I, I remember when I finished those scenes, I thought to myself, I never want to do that again. Mm. I, I, it was necessary. I ha- you know, it was necessary for the story and I felt it was necessary in the grand scheme of things, but I never want to do that again and and you know it it took a it took a while for me to even dive deep into that darkness again because with remote control there's there is that moment in the in the beginning of the book where it it was it hurt it hurt it wasn't fun to write that I Mm -hmm. typically would say that writing is an enjoyable experience for me these moments are not enjoyable Mm -hmm. um, but they feel they are necessary and so I I wouldn't say that I manage them so much as I I experience them and then I have to recover from them. Like I have to recover. It took me years to recover from who fears that. That was wow. Um, but like in order to in order to write them though, like I have to let my mind 
like, like I said earlier, that when I'm writing something, I am there. I am, you know, I'm seeing the world through the character. I'm experiencing it through the character. So I am there. And so like, um, when, so, so when I'm writing them, I have to allow myself to go into that darkness. And I think that in a lot of ways, you know, I draw from, uh, I draw from, you know, pain from my own past. I, I, I draw a lot from the experience um, that le actually led me to writing the, where I was paralyzed from the waist down, you know, waist down, just this, I wrote a whole uh, memoir about it, broken places and outer spaces. And, and I draw a lot from that. That is an, a, a never ending well of, of, of emotion and pain. So if I need to really, really feel it, I just, go there in my mind and then connect it to to what I'm writing so there's that um and then also I will and that's always difficult like in in my research either I will talk to people who have been through something similar to what I'm writing mm -hmm. which often is difficult in itself it's, it's, it's just it's like it's like going into it in, on an even even deeper level. So I'll, I'll do that whenever I can. Like if I'm writing, so if I can do it, I will. Um, mm -hmm. So the, that, and then also, um, re, I have an eye for finding the, those narratives that that for those first person accounts, and they're often difficult to find. Um, but if you research in a way, you can find first person accounts where they're describing something, and I'll draw directly from that too. But like those those scenes of of traumatic moments, they are, they are tough. They are, they are really tough. And then they definitely take from me, but they're, um, they're necessary and, and oh, they're wor a worthwhile experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm like thinking of specific scenes from both books where even just as a reader, right. I'm like, Oh no, <laughs> I felt that. Uh, yeah. um, and then thinking about having to write it. Um, this is like, tangentially related to what we were just talking about, which is um, not writing about, about, you know, really difficult things, but actually writing things that don't exist yet, I guess, out in the market or in traditional publishing. So, you know, I feel like for both of you, a lot, and you could tell me if this is like a conscious project or not, but a lot of what you write, like, it's not out there yet, right? Um, and so, this is something that I think about too, when I'm writing my own stories, like part of what I struggle with is I don't have models really for what I'm trying mm -hmm. to do, or there aren't as many. Yeah. And that just makes it harder. Um, and something that I sometimes think about is if I wanted to write a school story, uh, you know, set in like a traditional UK boarding school, I have a lot of examples for that. But mm -hmm. if I want to write a story set in pre-colonial Philippines, that's really hard because I just haven't seen that. Like, like it's not existing in my, you know, imagination drawn from media or other sources yet. Um, so I feel like you guys are both paving the way in a lot of the words and the lot works that you do. Um, so I'm curious, like how, how do you do that? Um, and, and secondly, how do you deal with a publishing industry that's like, quite determined to label the things you're creating, um, you know, a certain way, um, or maybe present your work a certain way that maybe, you know, doesn't quite match, but they're just trying to draw from the patterns that already exist. Um, so yeah, Jeff, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I think this is a really fascinating question. And I think it's a very different question for me, uh, maybe than for Nettie, or that maybe there's some overlap. Uh, for me, it's like, it's it's just the the hilariousness of writing early works that I knew were good, but they were recombining things. I don't know if they were necessarily innovative, but they were recombining things in such a way that they weren't recognizable as any one thing. And so this term new weird came along. And mm -hmm. suddenly all the stuff that wasn't publishable was being published by large publishers. And I, I couldn't get it published for the longest time by small publishers. <laughs> At one point I was almost ready to give up. So it was just like, it was so instructional how just a label or a moment mm. can just change everything so completely. <laughs> and then also how 
when it turned out that really new weird was just about the fact that people wanted to buy books from China Mayville meant that it almost destroyed a lot of careers. <laughs> like, I think I'm one of the few who actually survived that moment besides me. Um, and so it's, it, it, all of that is like intensely useful, was intensely useful to me to realize that I needed to take criticism on board, but I also had to understand where it was coming from. And often it would be coming from a place in the market that wasn't, that didn't understand what I was doing. And so I had to really be this weird combination of completely open to criticism, but then also being willing to reject stuff and being stubborn over mm -hmm. time to get published, to continue writing the unique stuff that I wanted to write. And then the thing you mm -hmm. talk about, about what's not out there. Well, what, what, what wasn't out there for me was like non-human perspectives in a fictional narrative, for example. Mm -hmm. um, there really wasn't a lot like that. Like I would read a novel and it'd be perfectly fine. And, but it was clear that the author had done a lot of research on physics, but all of the stuff about animals was like 30 years, uh, uh, out of date in terms of animal behavior science. Um, and in as much as we're in a moment where it's like crucial to like understand the earth a little better than we do, um, that, that really makes a difference. Um, and then also the fact that I like to use more experimental, um, structures. Um, and I, I like to, to try to now make them maybe more invisible, like in, in hummingbird salamander, I think it's still got some experimental things going on, but hopefully they're not as visible to the reader right off the bat, the way that like dead astronaut, which is basically a, a prose poem would be. Um, but this also is a matter of negotiating the marketplace, right? Because mm -hmm. every novel I write is different structurally and may appear despite the environmental themes to be very different. So until I was with MCD FSG, which published Annihilation, I had three different publishers for the, the three books of my trilogy before that, which is basically like putting your trilogy through an egg slicer and hoping someone will buy it. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so, um, so I'm very fortunate that I'm with a publisher that is about um, developing writers and not about a particular book and is willing to pivot <laughs> with me and can in terms of the marketing pivot with me. But I'm just extremely fortunate because there is an alternate earth where Annihilation sold like five copies uh, and each of my books since has come out from a different publisher <laughs> and there's been like no continuity, whatever. And, 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 you know, and I'm, <laughs> I'm basically writing stories, you know, on the side of the road for, you know, nickels or something, I don't know, which is fine. But, you know, uh, if that happened, that'd be fine. But, uh, but fortunately, I have a publisher that, that that's been able to make it work. So yeah. Nettie, thoughts? Yeah, this is, um, this topic is a lot. And I'm just sitting here trying to it pull is. my head, <laughs> like trying to pull it all together. It's a lot. Because um, I guess I'll start with the way that I when I first started writing, I knew, it wasn't that I knew I was writing something that was basically new. And, you know, I, I, I know nothing is new. I got that. I, I know that nothing is new, but what I was writing was new. <laughs> so it, it's in, and, and it came, you know, when I first started writing, it was fully formed. It was like, I was writing even before I, I can, and I'll discuss it in a second, but even before I coined the term African futurism, you know, the idea of that was something that I was writing from the very beginning and I knew what I was doing. Um, I didn't worry about this idea of, you know, it being something that there wasn't much of or was none of out there. I didn't worry about that because, and the the reason I didn't worry about it was because I was enjoying writing it mm -hmm. so much, you know, and the, the joy was what kept me writing. I wasn't like worrying about getting published. It wasn't, it, when I first started, I wrote for eight years without trying to get anything published. I was just enjoying myself. Mm -hmm. So like by the time I started getting published, that joy was there. I was already addicted. There was nothing that was going to make me stop writing, you know, writing these stories. Um, and, and like, I started writing these these stories that were kind of probing this idea of, of future Africa and, and, and African cultures and and and, and societies and um, and politics woven into um, extrapolating about the future, um, looking at spiritualities and cosmologies that like I I started writing that from going to, to trips going on trips to Nigeria with my family. And just being interested in that stuff. 
and then seeing um, seeing technology start over the years start popping up in really interesting ways. And I started just thinking about it. So it wasn't like I was thinking, oh, this has never been done. Let me do this. It wasn't like that at all. It was just it was just me being observant. And then me being interested and then started thinking about like, okay, what is this place going to be like in the future? So I started writing these stories and it was, it was always like the, the focal point of what I was doing. It wasn't, it wasn't conscious. It just was what I was doing. And so uh, fast forward to, and and also mind you um, growing up when I was reading things, you know, I grew up reading um, where I didn't have any other instances of science fiction that were not white and male. Like my library did not have anything mm-hmm. else. I discovered Ursula Le Guin during my PhD. I discovered Octavia Butler in the 2000s. So I'd never had any any examples or any you know um, any any writers where I look at them and be like, yeah, you know, they're doing what I'd love to be doing. I just I never didn't I didn't have that, and right. and I was fine with it because I existed on just like culturally, you know, socially, I existed on so many um, fault lines that. It was a place that I was used to being like, I didn't need to have an example to create it. So that was really how I came up. Um, And and so fast forward to once I started getting published, like when when I started um, submitting my work for publication, I wasn't thinking about what the climate was. It just didn't, I I don't know, it just didn't (laughs) cross my mind. I didn't think, oh, there's nothing like this out here. So maybe I should be cautious about blah, blah, blah. I didn't think that. I was enjoying what I was doing so much. And I just put it out there and was like, come what may, let, let's see what happens. That was always my, uh, my attitude. And so somehow, um, be it by luck or because of the attitude that I had was putting it out there, regardless, um, I found the right people who could vibe with what I was doing and who understood what I was doing. Um, but mm-hmm. I will say that that writing something is different from the way it's it's received because yeah there are all there are these um uh in publishing and and marketing there are templates and set you know uh molds that things have to fit in for people to understand what they are for people to recognize what they are um uh, people need labels they need to be able to say this is what they need to be able to look at this thing and be like it's that and if there's no name for it people get confused <laughs> or they start trying to put your fit your story into a category where it doesn't quite fit. And so when it doesn't quite fit, they shave off the parts that don't fit. And then they're viewing something that's re- reduced. And so I, I've suffered a lot from that. And I found that really frustrating. And that was why I ended up t- coining the, the term African futurism and then defining it and say, this is what this is because the, the definitions that are out there do not properly describe what I'm doing. And when you can't describe something, it basically doesn't exist to a lot of people. For me, I don't really, like I said before, I don't need, I don't need it to exist for it to exist, but a lot of people need that label. They need to know what to call it before they can understand what it is. So, yeah, I mean, that's like a a small um, uh, summary of, you know, that, of that issue, but that issue is very big. It's a, it's a big issue for me. One that I'm always, grappling with in some way yeah yeah the the categorization especially if you're someone who writes across genres and across forms right which you both do in in your work um I'm thinking about how you both have had you know pretty long careers here and and have yeah like written many different different types long. of books <laughs> <laughs> and I know there's like plenty more to go um, but, but 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 like both of you have talked about you know times when it was really hard right to persist um and maybe it was an internal thing or maybe um you know yeah like externally or I don't know if it was even hard or if it was just like people aren't getting what I'm doing and that's like, fine, I'm Mm going to keep doing it. But, you know, there are challenges with that. Right. Um, And being able to persist. uh, And I'm just sort of thinking, you know, was there anything specific um, that maybe helped you uh, and maybe also, you know, finding those advocates or finding people in the community who like get it more, um, who can keep you there. Uh, if you, I think that's something a lot of people struggle with, maybe a little bit more in the pandemic because we can't see other people. But how do you think about building community um, within this career and and finding people who can support you through that? 
Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I'm a bit of a, a curmudgeon in that I, I I honestly don't like joining groups. So the way that we've done it has really been through just championing, championing and befriending and seeking out the writers that we find interesting and cool and inter- and different and and also across. Uh, disciplines like artists and everybody else. And so Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's created a focal point for that though, are the anthologies that my wife, Ann and I have done Mm -hmm. where that has kind of created a sense of community for us through those. Um, But I'm very wary (laughs) of like cliques and groups of any kind. And so uh, in part, because I also feel like uh, when I have engaged at that level of community that I've wasted a lot of time just on the politics of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so, or, or arguments about genre versus literary or things like that. And so yeah. I'm very conscious of how little time I have left in a sense to write. And so, you know, I try to pick my spots on things like that and still be very supportive, obviously. And one thing I would say is that Michael Moorcock was an incredible uh, mentor to me in the sense that he gave generously of his time. He opened doors for me. He got me an agent. Uh, and so the one thing he said was, Jeff, pay it forward. Whenever you have an opportunity, if you have any influence, you have any, anything like that, pay it forward. And so that's one thing that I do uh, almost religiously is that I, if I have any kind of clout whatsoever, immediately spend it on, on giving it back to the community uh, in, in, in some way. I would also say, and I think Nettie just said this too, basically, that there was a huge amount of power early on in knowing that I would be writing whether I was ever published or not. Yeah. When you feel that way, when when you have so much joy from writing and you you realize that you you just you ha- just have to do it, uh, it makes a lot of career decisions a lot easier. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that it wasn't that there were difficult times because there definitely were, and I've chronicled some of them. But it definitely, at the end of the day, was like, well, I'm still going to be doing this, you know, <laughs> no matter what happens. Uh, and and so that was really useful. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm also, I, I'm just, I'm not a joiner, <laughs> you know, um, I, will, I, I like to be on the periphery. So like, you know, I, I'm part of many different, you know, many groups and many communities, but you will rarely see me like at the center of anything. I just, um, I'm just not a joiner. That's, that's just me. Um, I do like in terms of support systems, you know, I've, I have to say, um, I've had editors who have been extremely supportive. I mean, my my editor um, Betsy at, at at Daw, like she's one of the first people who saw what I was doing for what it was. You know, she she saw it. Mm-hmm. She saw, and this is you know at a time where like certain things now, of course, things are still you know, of course, um, in terms of various types of stories finally being told. Um, it, it, it's still, you know, we're, we're still in difficult times, but they're much better than they were. Um, what we're in 2021, like, 10 years ago, we're, really? in, we're much better than they were. And so like at that time for my editor to see what I was doing and, and understand it, she got it without having like, Oh, this is the cool in thing right now. So let me grab that. She didn't have any of that. Right. And she still saw what it was. As, and so like, and I've, I've stuck with her, um, for years now. And, and so like that to me is, um, one of those support systems that someone like me needs. Um, I have my, my uh, co-collaborator, um, the, the director, Waneri Kahiu, uh, Kenyan film director, Waneri Kahiu. We do a lot of projects together. Um, and, and as we branch into, you know, as I branch into screenwriting and, and, and TV and film and all of that, you know, she's, you know, a huge support system for me because it's a, it's an interesting, interesting world out there. But, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, and, and I do, and, and you know, I, I do a lot of, uh, a lot of speaking events and, and, I, and whenever I get the chance to speak to, um, you know, to new writers or, or yeah, new writers, I, I like to avoid the term young writers. It annoys yeah, me. <laughs> prefer <laughs> new writers. Um, you know, whenever I get the chance to, if I'm at these events, that's, you know, I'm, I'm always uh, ready to impart a lot of things that I've learned because I've learned so much in in this journey in so many different ways. I have a lot of, a lot of um, knowledge that I can impart. So whenever I can, I do that, but I'm, I'm just, you know, 
Yeah, my 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 in terms of my support community, my community of support, I keep it very small. I keep it mm-hmm. very uh, yeah. just just <laughs> focused because, like, yeah, the writing and the storytelling it takes it's a lot of time, and it's a, it's where I prefer it's where I prefer to dwell. Yeah, yeah, I think. I'm like the secret is not being a joiner. <laughs> then maybe you can get a ton <laughs> well, done. It depends. It for depends. Us, but not for everybody. I think it's different for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. We've established uh, a high level of comfort with solitude amongst this group, uh, yeah. which I call myself <laughs> part of too. Um, I'm going to uh, finish my questions and then move into audience questions. But my last question actually was on that last point. I know you've, you know, both been in roles where you teach, um, you know, or, or connect with newer writers. I'm curious if there's like one piece of advice um, that you think has really resonated or helped a lot of people. Uh, yeah. When you face them. <laughs> um, Nettie, if you want to start. Yeah. Um, there's so many, uh, but I think the one, the first one I always start with is to tell your story. Don't be afraid to tell your story. Like, don't like, because we all have those voices in our head that it say, like, whenever I'm writing something, there's always a voice in my head saying, this is terrible. This doesn't make any sense. You should stop doing it. It's always been there. And I don't, but I, but I, and I fully understand that I've been doing this for a while. So I've developed a very strong muscle to not listen to that, that voice at all. And I've had the proof over and over and over again. It, it will say, oh, this is terrible. And then I'll go back and read it and it'll be great. You know? So, so yeah. Um. That that fear of telling your own story, thinking that nobody wants to hear this, you know, like who would want to hear this? There's always someone who wants to hear your story. And then my my second um, bit of advice, and all these are cliche, but whatever, they're completely true too. Is to write, like don't don't talk about writing. Go and go and write. Like there's there are all kinds of ways to procrastinate. There are all kinds of ways to just not do it. But go go and write, go and do the work. And it is it does take time. It, it's not quick. Um, it, it, looking for instant gratification or validation is not going to get you the story, <laughs> the, the, the really unique and wonderful story that you want. That's my opinion, but I'm going to stick to it. Yeah, yeah, those are my main things. Yeah, love, love that. Yeah, Jeff? <laughs> I think um, Nettie's kind of hit it on the head in that, in that, a lot of the best advice does seem like cliches because it's actually just yeah. the, the truth. And, and, and because I think beginning writers sometimes want that like silver bullet or whatever of like the, the, the thing that's going to mm-hmm. like get them somewhere uh, faster. And I don't mean that they, they, they want to, everyone's like hungry. Right. But, uh, but I think that, I, th- I, th- I think that, that, that for example, you know, this, this industry is so volatile, especially right now, mm-hmm. nobody, nobody mm-hmm. knows what is actually going to be popular, not popular, mm-hmm. what's going to sustain a career or not that, that it is so important to do the thing that's personal or the thing that gives you joy or the thing you're most interested in, however, whatever your entry point is into writing and, and don't worry about what is seemingly popular in the moment. And, and I, I feel like I sh- that shouldn't have to be advice, but so many beginning writers and workshops seem to have angst about that because it's so hard to like yeah. block out what other people are doing. Yeah. Um, so you kind of have to just remind them about that. And then the other two things are for beginning writers, especially test your processes, test how you do things. Maybe you write at night, but you actually have never tried writing in the morning yeah. or whatever else. And so when you're a beginning writer, it's like testing out all those muscles and all those, those processes and figuring out what's the best routine for you even, or, or whatever it is with regard to your process, even how you like create characters or how you think about setting, just do it as many different ways as possible and, and worry less about getting the thing that you're writing published so much as, as getting a good idea of who you are as a writer. And then finally, the thing that has really sustained me is I love revision. I basically re-enter mm-hmm. the fictive dream when I rewrite and mm-hmm. I don't mind revision at all. I absolutely adore it. And I get just as much of a spark out of it as doing the rough draft. And you will save yourself a lot of grief <laughs> if you can get to that place. I think. <laughs> mm, love that totally too. Yeah. 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 Um, Excellent. Well, I have some pretty interesting audience questions, so I'll, I'll jump right in um, to those. Uh, this is from Galen. 
Uh, they say, you both illustrate vividly the dangers that corporations and careless governments pose to our environment. Do you think we can turn the tide against capitalism and corporate greed in time to save our one planet? Um, Jess, maybe you could start. No, no, uh, no, I, 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 no, it's not, a, it's not, it's not like a yes or no question. Cause it's like an right. ongoing struggle. Right. And in certain yeah. places it gets better in certain places it gets worse. It's almost like that mole game where the mole pops up and you try to, or ground or whatever you try to swat it. Like um, I, yeah. I think we have to, we have to get to a better place with regard to this. Uh, I think you see a, a kind of a, a beginning of a sea change. I'm really glad that the next generation who hopefully doesn't hate my generation too much um, <laughs> is, is really on board with this. Um, and the, the weird thing is that we need this situation to transition where like some of it's through regulation and some of it's through the systems we have. And some of it is like completely getting rid of systems that we have. So it's a weird, delicate kind of surgery in some places. And then just like a blow everything up in other places. And, and I think that's why it's, um, it's so tricky. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, do I have hope? I, I have hope we can av avoid the worst. Um, mm. But, uh, but I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's up in the air right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have I have hope, but I'm an irrational optimist. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that helps, but um, I I'm also like I there, you know, of course there is no no answer to that, and it also depends on the day for me. Like my answer depends mm. on the day. Mm -hmm. Like That's some good. days where I'm like, oh no, we're all you know, f words. <laughs> But uh, and then there are other days where I'm like, this is uh, possible. Like they're, 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 I'm seeing changes that that are giving me, you know, um, not just irrational hope, but actual rational hope. So um, mm -hmm. it depends on the day for me. But but above all of that, um, I want to try. You know, I think yeah. we should try. That's the main thing. It's like like don't like I don't like to focus so much on the outcome. But, you know, I'm the kind of person who, like, if I'm being attacked, I will keep fighting until I'm dead. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to keep fighting until I'm dead. So that's the way I, I, that sounds morbid. But, um, but you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, no, it sounds uh, <laughs> rational. It sounds like the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, just, just try. We should try. We should do everything that we can. If it's not enough, then it's not enough. Um, hopefully it is. Yeah. Um. I have a question from Althea who says, how do you balance difficult themes such as bigotry, dystopia, et cetera, with fantastical themes such as magic and wonder when you're creating a world? They're not separate. Mm -hmm. They're not separate. They are all it's like the world that you're creating. Um, if you're, if you're, if in my opinion, if you're doing it correctly, those things are not separate. They're all connected. They all affect each other. They're all part of each other. So the, the mystical aspects are touched by whatever's happening. You know, it, it's all, you know, it's all, it's like a, um, a spider web. And, and that's actually something that I have never had to even think about the idea of balancing the two. Mm -hmm. It just, mm -hmm. it, it's, if it's the, if it's the world, if you've built this world, and you're existing in this world, then, <laughs> then it is what it is, you know? I mean, it's like, there's no having to balance this aspect of the world with this as aspect of the world. It's like, um, when, when, I, when I'm writing a world, it's a living thing to me. So I don't dissect it because that will kill it. So it's like, you know what I mean? So mm. all mm. those mm. things, all mm. like the, the, everything that you, you just mentioned they're all part of that world. They're all in that world's DNA. So they're all, you know, yeah, I can't say that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, ultimately you're trying to do do something with regard to the setting that that is uh, approaches the granularity of the real world, even if it can never match it. Like mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you make compromises like an annihilation and the Southern Reach trilogy, I knew that there was no way, there was not room in the novels to have 
dysfunction and irrationality in government agencies and also have corporations, even though that would have been an element you might think would come into play. And so the government agencies had to basically take on the attributes of dysfunctional corporations as well. And then in other novels, I've, I've let the government kind of like be in the background and the corporations are front and center. So sometimes you will focus on a one thing, even though the rest of it is still there, depending on what you need to do. But um, hopefully it's coming across so organically, like Nettie says, mm -hmm. that it's all there in kind of a messy way. Like it can't be too neat either. If it's too neat uh, and too categorizable, then it's not really like the world that we live in either. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like not recognizable as a real place to some degree, I think. So um, yeah, so everything Nettie said is something I would have said too. So Yeah, the web. <laughs> web. <laughs> um, this is coming from Peter who says... Uh, where do you draw the line between keeping a sense of mystery in the writing, putting the responsibility on the reader to figure things out versus spelling things out for them? Um, yeah, Jeff, maybe you could start. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, it's hilarious because when I provide formal closure, for some readers, I haven't left a, enough mystery after Annihilation, but then there's people who like hate Annihilation because I complete the character arcs. Yeah. But there's no way to complete the story arc because it's about dealing, grappling with something that's beyond human comprehension. <laughs> um, so uh, so I think it it just depends. It's, it's whatever's right for the story. And for me, it always comes exactly. down to am I completing the story arc and the character arc, which of course are intertwined to some degree, but, but there is some differentiation there in terms of like what's actually happening in the story with the characters and what their like emotional places at the end of the story, or if I'm completing one or the other. And so for Hummingbird Salamander, for example, I knew I was going to basically be completing both, but leaving the story at a place where the reader's imagination would have to kind of kick in about certain things because mm -hmm. I had reached the end of the story as I saw it. So it's always kind of tricky, right? It's like sometimes I'll write past what I think is the ending just to see if I'm wrong about it. Um, mm -hmm. If it's a different kind of story than I thought, sometimes I'll write before the beginning of the story of the rough draft just to make sure, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, yeah, it's a tricky kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it really depends. It really depends. Um, and also you can't please everybody. No. <laughs> so, so there's that, you know, um, at some point you make a decision and that's what, you know, you, 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 yeah, you, you decide and, 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 and that's what it is. I mean, it's, it really, de it depends on the story. It depends on what's important in that particular story. It depends on like, and then there are times where I've finished the story where I'm like, I want to be, and I want to be obnoxious. And I know I'm like, no one's going to understand this. And I don't care. I want it to be <laughs> like this because this is what I think is, this is how it should end. So it's like, you know, it really, it depends. It depends. It depends. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but I think as, as the writer, there, there's something, at least for me, where like I, it feels right. It has to feel mm. like mm -hmm. it's a gut feeling, you know, gut, I, I sure. can't, yeah. yeah, you can't define it. You just, you just know it. You just know, you just it. know it. Yeah. Talent. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm thinking about both of your books. They, they kind of end more in an opening up than a closing in, mm -hmm. which I actually think is really rewarding as a reader. Um, but as you say, it depends on the reader too. They're they're completing yep. the story on their end, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's wrap up with Joshua's question, which is also a little bit open-ended. Um, the question is, what are some of your favorite creative practices or techniques for finding a story and allowing it to grow? Oh, gosh. Nettie, mm. you want to start? <laughs> um... <laughs> It's uh, one thing, one place where I always look for inspiration are, are things that make me angry. So there's that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something really, uh, things that give me some kind of negative emotion are always a great place to find story. If there's something that makes me extremely angry, there's something that um, really upsets me uh, where I'm just like, I want to fix that. I've had, I've done that a few times where I've read something and like, I, I can't deal. There's one short story um, that I wrote. It was called The Key. And it was about this girl. Um, 
So it was about a girl in, in Nigeria, and it was inspired by this girl who had been basically beaten to death by her father or her her, un- her uncle um, mm-hmm. for losing a key to the house. And there was, and I just saw this one short. It was like one paragraph. It mentioned her name. Um, it was just and that was all there was about her. Like that was all. And and this is this is this this thirteen year old girl who has just been erased from our, from the world. And I, I just thought, I'm like, no one's ever going to talk about her. No one's ever going to remember her. And I just saw the story. It was just a very random story. And I'm like, I, I want to fix that. I want to fix that. And the only way I can think of to fix that. And, and I, I wrote this story and I used her name and I rewrote the ending. Mm-hmm. You know, I rewrote the ending. And, and so, so like, that's one way, um, one way that I, that I gain inspiration from, th- from things like that. There's, and I have a few um, articles that I've seen in, in, um, in media publications where I've shelved them away. So I'm mm-hmm. like, this is so nasty. That <laughs> I need to deal with this. I have, I have like five of those. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that's always been, that's always been a source. Another um, source of inspiration has always been nature, wildlife, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, wildlife just inspires me in the most bizarre of ways. It's always unexpected because you know you can't control what what's going on out there, and you you just they just do stuff, and <laughs> you're just like, wow, okay, you're just giving me a story. So, yeah, I mean, I have like a plethora of of ways that I that I'm um, that I that I find stories or that I'm inspired. It's it's so there's just so much. There's so much. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that almost anything can be story. That's what I've learned over time. And so sometimes I let anything be story. Like someone said, you know, have you ever tried using the life cycle of the fluke worm as the structure for a story? And so I let that simmer for a while and I did. (laughs) And it was actually comprehensible. It was actually published by Tor.com. But, um, but, you know, it it really is. It's like it can start anywhere. And sometimes if I'm stuck, and it's not that I'm really that stuck that often because there's like a ton of ideas Mm -hmm. in that Okay, it's back there. But if I am stuck, I will literally start with a random point. Sometimes I will just start randomly writing anything that comes to mind. Eventually, a story will begin to accrete on that page or there's something right out the yep. window. Um, you just jump start it. Uh, and maybe half of what you get from that is totally not useful. But uh, but I, I just think being receptive and and realizing that 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 story may not be if you let yourself be open to it be the tough part but in terms of like the research stuff i did find this book fur town a while back which is about these animals uh mm-hmm. basically <laughs> saying that they love being turned into fur um it's like a propaganda thing for the fur industry and and i it was one of those things that you're talking about you don't wow. want in the house it's like so nasty but <laughs> at the same time i knew eventually it was going to be a spark for something because it was so bizarre and of course, it's something that's pretty pivotal to hummingbird salamander. <laughs> um, so, but it took 15 years. Oh, you know, yeah. I had this book in the house 15 years before it generated anything, but eventually it did. You know, so mm. yeah. Well, I've laid eyes on Fur Town now. Cool. I feel like kind of like uncanny suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is actually in the real world, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, well, that. I guess wraps up our show. Um, you know, I'm so <laughs> appreciative to both of you for, um, yeah, the conversation. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I was like taking little notes throughout. Um, so I'm Isabel Yap, and you've been watching the Bay Area Book Festival. Mm-hmm.